<laughs> Welcome to Life Flow. This is George G. And the time is right. Welcome to today's guest, strong and powerful Chuck Rinker. Chuck, are you ready to do this? Let's go. Let's go. Chuck is the CEO of Personas. He's an Imagineer without the ears. He's developed a digital personality engine, bringing human engagement to the self-service solutions. Excited to have you on, Chuck. Tell us a little bit about your personal life, some more about your work, why you do what you do. Sounds great. I appreciate it, George. Yeah, um, you know, I grew up a cattle farmer up in Virginia, of all things, and turned into a human AI expert. And kind of go, you know, doesn't everybody do that? Um, yeah, I was just kind of um, fascinated with technology as a kid growing up on a farm. I had one of those original Mattel football games that came out like 1977, of course. I'm showing my age, of course. But back then, you were, Mattel was able to convince you that this little red dot on the screen was a quarterback or a lineman. And so I, I was really fascinated by how your brain can immerse yourself into believing about these personalities. So digital personalities and digital humans aren't as new as everybody says they are. They're just more advanced. So I got into this technology engagement about how, do we, how can technology and humans engage. Um, we lived outside of DC. My dad kind of recognized an early passion I had for this type of tech. So he was able to get me in with some of the the military happenings around the DC area. So I got into simulations and training all at an early age in the black ops world and did a lot of that. That kind of led me into something I wanted to do a little more entertaining. So I started getting into the game development side of it outside the simulation. And after really becoming enamored with gaming and how gaming can be an escape and how gaming can engage people at an emotional level, at a human level, that's why everybody claims, you know, well, games are addictive. Well, to be blunt, yeah, they are but they're addictive because they're so engaging with you as a person. So I was able to work my way up through the ranks where I ran the um, NCAA and Madden football franchises for EA Sports and went like, you know, this is the ultimate, this is the ultimate gaming. But then as I got a little older and wanted to do something a little different, I've been in that world for, for you know, decades. I said, you know, what can you do with this that has a, to be blunt, a bigger purpose? So I started this company almost 20 years ago. We've really been advancing into how to support different communities and all. And now we're up to the point where the technology's caught up with the ideal. The ideal was always to do something amazing where what could you do if you could engage and get people as addicted to their health, as addicted to wellness, as addicted to serving underserved communities, as addictive to bridging the gap for inclusivity and diversity. What, how could you do that? Now we're at a point in technology that that's possible. So that's really what Personas is all about, is that ultimate form of using digital personalities to connect consumers, patients, traveling public, uh, underserved communities with all this great technology you hear about, AI technology, um, um, IOTs, all the scalability of tech is not to, up to this point been accessible to all. So this concept of digital personalities is meant to bridge that communication gap between the technology and the human engagement. Fascinating how to your point about uh, about that, 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 that original game you were playing mm -hmm. and it's like it's interesting how my brain is happy to accept that this little dot is in fact a quarterback running around and that's you yes. know movies have certainly grown and evolved over time but we were happy you know long time ago to sit in a screen and let our imagination run wild and 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 accept things that certainly didn't really look very good but totally fine you are absolutely correct i feel like i'm preaching to the choir a little bit because um, um you get it obviously and um it's interesting you bring that up, though, because a lot of interest and a lot of publicity is around digital humans now. Hollywood has this um, portrayal of digital humans and AI as this, you know, evil thing that's going to come out of the woodworks and you know determine that humans are not needed on this planet, so we're going to replace them. And a lot of our, and, and I don't want to call them competitors, because there's a lot of good work being done in a lot of areas. But one thing you'll notice about the approach we take and why I'm very, very specific about not using the word digital human in our, in our product is I learned very early on, I was um, I had the honor of sitting with the vice president of Imagineering at Disney and was pitching some of these concepts to Disney. Um, I'd done a little bit of work with the Imagineers down in Celebration. 
And we'll go into that, but I actually did a fun little project where I engaged patients at the Celebration Hospital using an animated bear with another company and how that improved the outcomes and reduced sedation rates in pediatric care when kids had to get imaging. How do you get them comfortable in an environment? How do you get them to trust what they're going through and to have something they can relate to? And that's a real world example of where it's really already helped kids. Um, you know, we've reduced pre-op, post-op, They've had lower sedation rates and the kids were just more comfortable going through these scary procedures. So um, the, the point is, is um, that as we got into um, this digital human versus digital personality, our competitors are kind of going with this belief that they want things ultra photorealistic. And, you know, how does, how does George look? George has a certain hairdo. He's got certain gestures as he's not as a head up and down to me and the grin on his face <laughs> and what his knowledge base in his brain and what John Snotty taught me very early. And it was in a short four hour session with John. And he used to run a game company where he was bringing photographs of humans, of the players into the game. And he said, be careful, you're hitting the uncanny valley, Chuck. And not everybody knows what the uncanny valley is. Not to put you on the spot, George, but have you heard the term uncanny valley? I just, I just wrote that down. It's when something is close enough, but 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 not quite close enough. It makes us uncomfortable. Maybe. Yeah, it's the easy way to describe it is the horror movies we watch. When a head turns a little farther than it should, or the the wrist joints lurk a little there, or something looks really human, like like the Gollum character, but not quite human, and it becomes creepy. And he's like, you don't want to creep people out. And Disney knew this in 1928. Disney makes you cry when a deer gets shot. Disney can, makes you believe that a skunk can talk, that a fox and a snake can run a country. So that whole belief of, of what your psyche goes through is really the approach we take. So I basically jokingly try to steal the name and thunder of the, you know, the, the great, wonderful Walt. You'll find I'm a big follower of the Disney um, mentality and how Walt Disney was a technologist at heart, not necessarily an animator like people think. Um, and so the belief there is that our characters are meant to be instilled with personality. It doesn't matter if their eyes are a little bit too big. It doesn't matter if their hair is not perfect. What matters is, can you relate to it? Is it relatable to you? Do you have what we call in the gaming industry a suspension of disbelief? Do you really believe in the personality behind it, not the physical representation of the character? So, so our mantra is really human communication, not human replication. And, and that's an important distinguishment in where I believe the market's gonna go and where I believe you're gonna bridge the gap for some of the, um, I'll call it more important, and that's a little bit a little bit of a soapbox, but the little more important work we're trying to do like within clinical trials, um, for, for example, in instances where you have to earn trust, you have to be empathetic to your audience, you have to be able to be relatable, you have to be able to have characters that have multiple cultural backgrounds that can speak our characters. They'll speak 148 languages. We have two members of the deaf community on staff and we teach our avatars how to do sign language and how to communicate with all audiences. And so it's that communication gap that we're trying to bridge. And, and that's a distinguishment we make in, in, in the development of our personalities and how we're gonna apply them to, um, I think you get into how we're gonna apply them to what are real practical applications to people, you know, go, this is pie in the sky. This is creating digital humans, whether regardless of whether they're gaming like characters or not. Um, um, but there's a real, a real need for those underserved communities and how do you support um, uh, the improvement? We're making great progress, but we're not there in diversity, inclusivity um, and getting overall communication. So, so that's where our um, passion lies. I think it's fascinating. <clears throat> how do you get people to, I'm fond of saying I'd rather be useful than brilliant. So I want to be able to get a message across in a way that somebody's going to be accepting of it and it's trust, it's empathy, it's being relatable. And otherwise, if people are looking at me like this, this, this is this is BS, it's too good to be true. I I I, I don't like it. I'm I'm not connecting. Whatever those are, those are your barriers to doing the work that you're interested in doing. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and you're nailing it. Like I said, you could probably be uh, delivering most of this podcast on your own without me because um, um, the concepts are there. And it's just really um, there's a technology stack to not get too geeky on it. That's really required to pull this off. And so what I like to tell people is um, the company we created, I, I call it when gamers get serious. 
like my CTO is a um, um, ex developer on the Madden franchise, worked on Wimbledon scoring systems. You know, my CIO has a UX degree. My CTO has an animation degree. Um, we're basically um, a company of about 16 people and we have um, a good significant portion of our company comes from gaming background or interactive technology backgrounds. And I call ourselves the, the left and right brain companies. I mean, my background goes from double E to computer science to 3D animation and multimedia tech. Um, so we really do, to your point, what it takes to pull this off is really complex on the back end, but at the end of the day, it's got to be just simple and believable to the audience. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're not trying to be voice and personality only interfacing, you know, touchscreens still have a great place. Not everybody is comfortable talking and, and especially when they're trying to carry on a verbal conversation like you and I are having and uh, knowing that there's a technology behind there. Um, um, sometimes there's personal information that's advocated for that's needed. Um, you know, checking in at a doctor's office, for instance, but that'd ah, be perfect. But not everybody wants to sit there and give their personal information in the lobby of a doctor's office. So we're not saying we're applicable everywhere, but there are very specific use cases um, that make that simplified interface very, very practical. Um, some of those I touched on earlier, general customer engagement. You know, everybody talks about chat bots and chat GPT going on right now. Um, you know, but, but what if the chat bot wasn't something you had to sit there and like people like me that have been in tech forever, I can type, you know, 135 words a minute, but not everybody wants to do that. To get the answers they're frustrated because they're they're not getting the customer service they need and they want to jump on a website and go hey i need your help here's what's going on tell me what to do and 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 although you can um, get a lot of that through chat box that's not a that's not a personality that's not a human engagement that's not a connection between you and your brand whether that brand is a commercial brand like disney i'll bring disney up everybody knows disney's one of the most beloved brands on the face of the earth and it's because Everybody has an emotional bond to that company. Um, practical examples, Flow, you know, Flow from Progressive, the Gecko Gecko. You know, there's all these instances where people find that brand loyalty and brand trust is earned through the rapport and the um, personality behind that brand. So now if we bring that into healthcare, like I mentioned, we've done probably 12 to 14 different clinical trials um, where we've helped um, um, opioid addicted young females deal with babies born with addiction. And we've done that through a very um, targeted consent where we give them the pros and cons of what they're gonna do in this trial. But um, to bring up, a uh, hopefully not a politically incorrect example, but if you have a young female with a drug problem, having children out of wedlock that are addicted to drugs, are they gonna to wanna to sit there and talk to this 65 year old gray haired man you see behind the camera right now and tell me why they made the decisions they made? They immediately feel judged. They immediately feel at ease. What's this guy? I can't relate to that guy. He doesn't know what I'm going through. He knows nothing about me. He's this old you know, rich white guy sitting behind his desk and uh, claiming to be CEO of a human AI company. You know, <laughs> what, why, do, why do I wanna tell him anything? And that, that's, that's a, half joke and I got a good chuckle out of you for it, but the reality is that that is reality. So we created a series of characters that were either Hispanic, black female, white female, younger generational, and they were very empathetic in their area and very trustworthy. And ironically, there are clinical trials and clinical studies that support that human psychology, that there is a trust and empathetic um, 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 use for digital humans and digital uh, personalities that we're creating fascinating and flow and the, and the gecko are are wonderful examples so theoretically speaking i could go to the gecko website and then have an interaction with the gecko yeah how, how fun would that be <laughs> it would probably be more fun than dealing with some customer service person regardless of what they right. looked like and if you do get that opportunity someday i was lucky enough to spend a little bit of time with them I didn't know, because nobody really knows, is the Geico Gecko Australian accent or British accent? I don't know. <laughs> the world may never know. <laughs> yeah, the world may never know. All right. So 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 what does the what does an engagement look like? A company says this is really interesting. Let's just talk and you what kind of walk us through that. 
We have a couple of use cases that bubble up to the top. So at, at the general um, organizational level, enterprise level, a company would come to us and say, we already have an enterprise solution. We're not trying to be um, targeted verticals. We're really what we call a DXP. We're, we're an experienced platform, kind of a UX layer. If you remember way back in the day when first people were first using bulletin board systems and all your online interactions were text. And then, ooh, this wonderful thing called the internet came out and there was this wonderful little language called HTML that allowed you to uh, create graphics and interface and create an actual user interface, regardless of what the content behind it is. So we're really that same company, but we're that company for this digital personality, digital human. If you're an enterprise software company or you're a um, customer service related company, we've done work with like Ikea, Wrangler, um, Pepsi, you, you name it. We've, we've got a lot of early, it's really early in the market, but a lot of early uh, pilots and proof of concepts going on. Um, so you would say, you know what? I've got all this great, wonderful, scalable technology, but how do I make it more usable by my customers, by my patients, by the traveling public? We've done several uh, airports as well, um, hospitals. You know, how do you make all this great technology accessible? So they would come to us and we would have these, um, this API, this basically this layer um, between their enterprise solution and their audience. And that layer is that communication layer. And it's no longer limited to HTML where I can throw pictures and video clips and chat text box. Now you can actually put a digital personality between you and your audience. And that's where we fit into that ecosystem. Now, what we've done since we are pretty early in the market still, and we wanted to prove some verticals and some use cases, we've built specific use cases that we have a, I keep using the word passion, but let's just say we have a belief that are wonderful use cases and we'll showcase what is really possible, the art of the possible, as we say. And two of those are in wayfinding, which sounds really simple, um, but it's a complex problem um, indoor wayfinding, especially at uh, like hospitals, where in the UK and some of the uh, NHS trust uh, hospitals in uh, Europe, and because they have a bigger language problem, we do our phone call problem. They have multiple uh, uh, a bigger language barrier, multiple uh, languages they speak. So we've deployed over there. So if you're walking into a hospital and you've worked with a wayfinding company, you would either go to a map or you have to figure the map out, or you have to punch buttons and try to find keywords and all. With ours. As an example, you would walk up to the unit. They actually have a proximity. They know when you're in front of them. And they'll go, hi, welcome to Hospital XYZ. What can I help you find? And it's not just going, hey, where are the bathrooms? Which she can't answer that. But she's more informational. It's conversational. So you could literally say, hey, I need to get my prescription filled. She'll say, oh, well, you need the pharmacy. And the pharmacy is down the hall to the left. And oh, by the way, scan your QR code and you carry the map with you. Or I'm here for an appointment with uh, uh, Dr. Rinker. Okay, Dr. Rinker's in the imaging lab. That's upstairs on the seventh floor in the back. So it's meant to be that level of um, 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 service where the hospitals can't have, you can't have a one-to-one -one engagement. You can't hire enough staff to provide that sort of um, um, service. So it's not about replacing the staff, but it's about staff augmentation. So now the argument we give or as to the ROI we give uh, to enterprise customers or like, let's take that scenario. We would say, well, because I'm, I'm, I'm a cancer survivor. My wife's a cancer survivor. We've spent, let's just say, way too much time at MD Anderson over the last five years um, dealing with huge campuses and medical facilities. And you're in there, you're in a state of mind that's not, normal and you're trying to find out what's going on and our first intuition is to grab the first person wearing their scrubs or have the stethoscope around their neck and go hey i need your help we don't know what their role is at the hospital we don't know what they're interrupting and what we learn is that a significant portion of time the staff is answering these basic customer service questions so we're really trying to remove what are the repetitive mundane low value transactions that your high value personal collateral your human collateral the surgeons the nurses the healthcare professionals the practitioners um, um, the facility support personnel everybody that's in there has incredible value to their organization and what if we could work with that organization and give them back 20 to 30 percent of that time we can't replace we're not trying to replace them 
or another productivity tool. Just like you got a computer in front of you, you got a headset with a microphone on your head. We're just building another productivity tools. Ours just happen to have a personality behind them and, and have eyes and a mouth and a nose, but that's just to enable that technology at a more human level. Powerful. That's a perfect example to, to, to illustrate, uh, to illustrate how it works. So thank you for that. Chuck, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people Absolutely. learn more about you? How can they engage with personas? Um, if you want to talk to me personally, I, I'm, I'm a big advocate of LinkedIn. You'll find me in my LinkedIn profile, Charles Rinker personas. Um, but as far as learning about digital personalities in general, um, real simple website, personas.com, P-R-S-O-N-A-S.com. Um, and um, if for those, we really do have a belief that healthcare is a needle we can move and we have a desire and passion to improve outcomes in clinical trial and patients and wellness, overall wellness and health. We, we all need a little bit of help in that category. Um, so we do have a specific um, deployment of our pers personas engine for healthcare that we're calling iHealth Assist, the letter I health, just like it sounds, and assist, A S S I S T iHealthAssist.com, and that will give you some use cases within health and wellness as well. Excellent. Well, if you enjoyed as much as I did, show Chuck your appreciation and share today's show with a friend who also appreciates good ideas. You can find Chuck on LinkedIn under Charles Rinker, R-A-N-K-E-R. -E Check out Personas.com, P-R-S-O-N-A-S.com. And if you are more interested in the healthcare applications that we've been talking about, check out the letter I healthassist.com. Thanks again, Chuck. Thanks for your time, George. Take care. And until next time, remember, do your part by doing your best.